Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, this is to welcome our presenters today for our Biodata webinar, um, which is looking into graph databases. So our first speaker of the day is uh, Rick Van Bruggen, and he's going to be discussing a short intro into graph databases and why contract tracing is a graph database problem, and also how companies may benefit from the implementation of graph technologies uh, to tackle these business challenges. So without further ado, I'm just going to put you through to, uh, to Rick. Super. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And, uh, I can't see you, but I'm hoping you can see me. Uh, great to be here. And thank you for the invitation of, uh, of Biodata to, uh, to host this webinar. Um, my name is Rick, Rick Van Bruggen. I work for a company called uh, Neo4j. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, you've come across us before. Uh, we're uh, originally a Swedish company. Uh, now we're, we're kind of uh, all over the world, uh, I would say. Uh, with lots of really cool implementations of graph technology in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, and beyond, I would say. Um, and we consider ourselves pioneers in graph technology in general, right? Right, because we really think that there's a there's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting evolutions happening. Um, you know, the rise of connections in data, uh, as we sometimes call it, uh, meaning that, you know, more and more use cases, more and more companies are trying to make sense of their data, create new insights, create new competitive advantage with their data by looking not just at, you know, the elements, uh, the data elements, the isolated data elements, but also uh, looking at the connections between the elements, right? So I think there's a, there's a growing understanding that, you know, a data element in itself, a transaction or, a, or a, a, an asset or a, a whatever it may be, a molecule, whatever it may be, um, uh, the data in itself obviously has a lot of value and is very meaningful. But, but if you can see how that piece of data connects to other pieces of data, it actually brings you uh, a lot of uh, additional insights, right? And so we see that this uh, this actually plays really well into lots of you know mega trends, as we might call it, you know, where companies are really trying to innovate and and uh, you know make sense of of their already existing uh, data silos uh, by connecting them, right? By by making making sure that they can, for example, apply artificial intelligence on top of it, or by integrating the data, or by doing some fancy um, algorithms, running fancy algorithms on top of it. That's how they create this new business value with you know, existing data sets that they, that they just really need to interconnect, right? And I guess that's where, where the, the interest of um, graphs and graph databases as well is coming in, as it allows you to do that in a really, really easy way. And, you know, we're kind of seeing a lot of interest in this. You know, there's a lot of um, uh, really big organizations that are starting to make use of it. And, um, you know, from, you know, retail organizations, uh, travel organizations, uh, uh, logistical organizations, pharmaceutical organizations, um, and they're, try they're starting to apply a lot more innovative, um, uh, you know, uh, discovery processes on top of this, right? So uh, we see a lot of improvements to be made in analytics, in machine learning, um, you know, using using these new techniques to uh, to deliver value, right? When you look at Neo4j, um, as you can probably tell from just the name, uh, it's actually something that's been around for quite some time. We've been hacking away at this problem for 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 more than uh, uh, 15 years now. Uh, Neo4j was originally started as an open source project in Malmö, Sweden, um, back in the early 2000s, 2001, around that time frame. Um, and it really became you know, commercial technology a little bit later on, 2009, 2010. I joined the company in 2012, um, and I've been, uh, been working with it ever since. And the core of the technology is really what we call this native graph uh, infrastructure, native graph technology, native graph databases and tools, right? What we mean with that is that, you know, it's it's graphs, so it, it's all about networks, about these connected structures that we're trying to manipulate with our data infrastructure. But we do it in a native way so that it really becomes a lot easier to do so. 
right? It becomes more easier, more powerful, more 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 uh, quick, and also to uh, to manipulate uh, these graph structures. I mean, you can represent a graph in an Excel file if you wanted to, right? It's not that difficult to represent graphs in in any database structure. But if you do it natively, if you build the infrastructure from the ground up to represent this type of data, then all of a sudden all of these things become so much easier. And, and I guess that's where what we're going to uh, going to uh, going to talk about a little bit here, because at the end of the day, it's really about making this graph technology, which really literally has been around for centuries. Um, we're trying to make it more accessible, more more um, applicable and insightful for for uh, organizations, big and small. Right, so native graph technology is what this is all about, and at the end of the day, where it's based on a very simple but powerful paradigm. Right, this is all about representing data in a different data structure. Right, so we're not working with table structures anymore, like we've you know all been uh, educated to do so in uh, uh, in the past 40 years, I would say. Right, but we're going to work with this very simple data structure that you see here, which is essentially a node connected to another node, right? Uh, a node, you can kind of compare it to um, the structure that you would, would also represent in a relational database system as a record, right? So it's a it's an instance of an entity, right? It could be an employee, could be a city, could be a company, could be a, you know, a book, could be all kinds of things, you know, an instance of an entity, right? So a row in a table is essentially what you're representing there. And all of these things have properties, right? So names, keys and keys and values, right? So names, dates, whatever they are, right? Uh, but the cool thing about it is that they are explicitly connected to one another, right? In a normal, you know, traditional relational database system, you would have a table for employees and a table for companies, and you would have to do a join to see which employee works for which company, right? Uh, that join is, you know, the heart of the problem that we're trying to solve here, because by representing that join no longer as something that you do at query time, but by representing it as a relationship, as these little arrows that you see here in this data, little data model, um, and storing it explicitly in the data model in the database at right time, all of a sudden those join operations become way, way simpler at query time. Right? This is the <laughs> the heart of what we're doing here. It's it's literally you know, avoiding joys at joins, not joys, uh, we're avoiding joins at query time and doing them, basically connecting things up at right time, right? By, by basically saying, you know, company, employee, they're already connected to one another. At right time, all I need to do is follow that little arrow, you know, because the join has already been done. Right, that's the labeled property graph. That is exactly what this is all about. We're representing data in a new way. Uh, we're, we're we're using the the property graph to store the data in a database management system, and that means that we will be able to um, do uh, different operations on top of it. Right, traditional databases we are really good at storing and retrieving data. You know, big data technologies, you know, aggregate stores like document stores or key value stores or column family stores are really good at aggregating and filtering data, right? But graph databases are all about these connections, about, you know, deriving insights from these correct connections, about making these connections first-class citizens. You know, we really want to leverage those connections to, to do something new. So essentially what I'm talking about here is two things. You know, you're talking about two kinds of benefits that you can get from graphs um, in pharmaceuticals or in, in bio biotechnology. Uh, the first one is that it becomes way more uh, simple and, 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 uh, and uh, manageable to represent complex data models as a, as a network. Right, because in a, in a traditional data model, you know, a relational data model, you would have all these join tables sitting in the middle, right? You would have employees and companies and a join table in the middle, and it basically blows up the, the size of the data model because you, you know, you have, a, you have these uh, relationships, uh, those join tables in the middle. 
right? Here, you're dealing with a much simpler data model to represent these densely connected domains, right? Which gives you a lot of, you know, ease of maintenance, ease of flexi uh, flexibility, um, ease of implementation as well, um, and, and, and ease of understanding, I would say. You know, it makes it way easier for people to understand the data that is being stored here. Right, so this is kind of like a longer term uh, benefit that we're getting from working with these property graphs. Uh, but I would also argue that, you know, the short term benefit that we're going to see here um, is that because these join operations have already been pre-calculated, have already been stored, persisted inside the data model, that kind of means that at read time, and remember, most people read their data a lot more than they write it, right? So uh, at read time, we have to do a lot less work, right? And that means more performance. It's going to be quicker, right? So there's a lot of things that all of a sudden become possible because you have already done them once at write time, and at read time, it just flies through it. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, if you if you would talk to your your DBAs, you would know you would know the answer when they when you try to ask them for a system that can do more than a, you know a handful of join operations, right? Because joins are compute intensive. If you can avoid joins, your DBAs will be happy, <laughs> right? So essentially, that's what it is. And uh, you know, I, gu I guess that you know this system, the uh, the graph database system or the graph database platform, I would say, it really allows you to do these things uh, much more efficiently. So in highly connected domains, in you know, highly connected query patterns as well, you're just going to see a dramatic boost in performance and, and a lot of things that become possible that weren't possible before, right? So what are we talking about here? You know, what kinds of um, use cases are we looking at here? Um, and I'll, you know, you'll hear about two of them in a little bit more detail today, right? So we're going to talk about contact tracing, and we're going to talk about knowledge graphs a little bit later on as well. Uh, but effectively, you know, there's quite a few areas where you can apply this, where you can apply um, this new data model and this new type of querying uh, to 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 real business applications. Um, you know, I've just highlighted a few of these here, um, but like for example, recommendation systems is a great use case. Fraud detection systems is a great use case. Network operations, you know, anything related to networks, right? If you can store the network as a network. It kind of helps, you know, uh, if when it's an electricity network or a rail network or a bus network or a logistical network or whatever it is, you know, storing networks as networks is, is is interesting because you can you can optimize a lot of things there. But there's a lot of interest also in in in, in like more um, you know data governance oriented domains like uh, master data management or identity and access management. There's quite a few things there that we can do to optimize how people store their data with uh, with graphs. And it's all because, you know, first of all, the modeling becomes so much more easier. And secondly, some of these query patterns, they just, just become a lot more efficient. Right, so that's like that's essentially what we're what we're uh, what we're trying to do here with uh, with graphs. And it's also why um, we wanted to highlight a couple of uh, use cases to you uh, that are related or are relevant to the uh, the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries, um, because obviously the uh, the pandemic that hit us uh, earlier this year has kind of uh, brought to life a couple of really really interesting problems data problems right and um and i'm i'm going to talk about one of them and, and kirsten is going to talk about another one a little bit later on um let's see here oh, what what are we what are we uh, what are we going to talk about you know i will leave the part about the, the knowledge graphs to to kirsten right so uh it's probably the, the the more impactful or the more interesting part and i'm going to talk about uh what what i kind of uh, explored with and what i've worked with customers on in the past couple of months which is really using graphs for contact tracing right and i, and I, I you know just to frame this a little bit you know what do we mean here at the end of the day you know We've all seen this happen, you know, as citizens, as employees, as as uh, as uh, you know, biotech uh, uh, industry members. I would say, uh, what we're trying to avoid here is that, you know, in the next wave, which you know, I live in Belgium, it's kind of hitting us right at this very moment. Uh, um, 
this next wave, you know, people want to avoid that we have to lock down the healthy people. Right? That's really what we want to avoid. We want to lock down the sick people, sure. Right, people that have that have contact have contracted the virus. Yes, sure. We we need to con uh, uh, lock these people down and quarantine them, right? But the healthy people, we should try to keep them healthy and let them let them uh, go about their daily lives as much as possible, right? So uh, uh, there's been a lot of debate, and I'm sure it's been the same in in your countries about how to do this, you know. And contact tracing is an essential tool for this. Understanding who has been contaminated, who has high risk of contracting the disease or spreading the disease, it's an essential tool for us to, you know, allow the, the the society to basically continue to work without having to go through these lockdowns again right so i it's, it's kind of like a big deal i mean i i feel quite uh, strongly about it uh, uh having been locked in this room for <laughs> such a long time i i i i don't want this to continue until you know I'm even grayer than I am already. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's kind of important to make sure that we that we understand who is at risk here, who might be spreading the disease, um, and obviously there's there's lots of different ways that you can do this. There's lots of ways that you can organize this, uh, but essentially uh, there's two types of systems that have been. Uh, proposed, right? It's a it's a centralized system or a decentralized system, right? Centralized system where you kind of keep track of um, all of the all of the information in a centralized repository. Uh, the decentralized system where you know maybe your phone would know about uh, your uh, uh, um, exposure, but no one else would, right? And obviously there's pros and cons to that both approaches, right? They're not, uh, you know. Uh, an absolute blessing in in one or the other direction right so i guess the the summary from what i can tell at least is that the centralized system is a lot more privacy sensitive and you know we want to be very careful with that uh, uh, especially in uh, in in uh, today's uh, polarized political climates um, it's kind of important that we don't uh, centralize too much data or expose that to too many people uh, when it's not required right um, but you know it kind of also allows us to see bigger patterns and bigger anomalies um, in a much more predictive fashion we can see things a little bit more clearly when we look at the bigger picture right uh, so that allows us to look at population-wide patterns for example Right, which is kind of a big deal. It's kind of important, right? Um, the decentralized approach is all about stopping the chains, right? It's all about stopping the the, the contam contam contamination chains and um, making sure that the population can l limit the spreading of the disease by just you know cutting it at one point, right? So I guess both approaches have have their merits. Um, and the application of graph theory to this uh, domain is is not new at all. <laughs> it's uh, it's been pioneered by lots of different uh, different uh, people, academics, uh, industry specialists, uh, pharmaceutical companies alike. You know, it's it's uh, it's been described in many books. It's not like this is a, a um, you know rocket science or anything. Um, so what, when, when, when the pandemic hit us and, you know, everyone's social li life basically got decimated, I quite, did quite a bit of work to try and illustrate that we could apply this beautiful new graph technology uh, that the uh, FJ and other people have been pioneering, um, that it could really prove its merits here. Right, and 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 contribute to uh, to a broader solution, and that's where you know Neo4j at least, uh, you know, ever since you know for years already, you know, we did the Panama Papers a couple of years ago. We did a lot of other research in the meanwhile, uh, and we, we we do believe in in a in a greater good and a graphs for good uh, initiative. So we 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 try to help out and, and and illustrate that the technology could help and. I personally did that by writing a number of blog posts um, where I very simply illustrated that, you know, in a synthetic data set, right, it's a very simple uh, synthetic data set that you could very easily apply very interesting um, uh, 
uh, pathfinding algorithms and community detection algorithms and predictive algorithms to understand how the disease was spreading inside our communities, right? So I started with this synthetic data set where a person visits a place, right? Um, and, and therefore, if two people visit the same place at the same time, that means that they meet each other, right? So there's the person meets person uh, relationship there. Um, and based on this uh, data model, you can write a number of queries, right? And, and some of those queries are really, really interesting, but I would really encourage you to take a look at this yourself. And I, I've actually uh, 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 just spun this up uh, this afternoon myself. If you go to sandbox.neofj.com, right? You can actually choose a new project Right, and you can actually spin up a contact tracing database yourself, right? A sample contact tracing database yourself, obviously, and you can just uh, take it for a spin and see what it what it what it does, right? So if I if I open this over here in my Neo4j browser, I'm hoping this didn't uh, expire. Of course, it did. Uh, give it a, a second or two, but it actually opens up a Neo4j browser, right? Which is the tool that people use to interact with graph databases and it allows you to run through you know a sample data set here right and run a couple of queries right so we've got the data model that I just showed you right with um, people visiting places and people meeting people right um, and then you can just run through a couple of queries here let me just find an interesting one uh, like for example here um, for example, this one here allows you to look at which people have visited the same place at the same time, right? So, and if of course these people are sick, have been diagnosed, tested as sick, then we could actually infer that uh, that they might be at a at a higher risk level, right? There's also some queries here that allows you to um, just some flicking through this here. Um, because I'm assuming that most of you will, will take uh, take this uh, for a spin later on. Um, we can also apply some graph algorithms here. Some, some of these graph algorithms are super fascinating. I'm, I know that you've used graph algorithms today, right? Because if, you, if you've used Google search, then you've used an algorithm called PageRank. PageRank is an algorithm that ranks the search results, not because of you know who pays the most for the advertising, but because uh, uh, you know it actually looks at how things are connected to one another. Right? I'm old enough to remember web search before Google and how shitty it was, and uh, uh, you know Google actually innovated the web search industry by looking at the graph of connected pages and looking at you know the, the pages that are most connected are more likely to be you know, relevant to your search, right? And you can apply the same thing to contact tracing, right? The person that is most connected to other people and to other places is more likely to be of significant influence on the spread of the pandemic, right? That's the logic here, right? So you can actually run uh, queries here uh, that allows you to, this is a, a page rank query, right? Uh, it writes the page rank uh, property, it calculates the score, and it writes the page rank property on top of my nodes here, uh, meaning that I can very easily see, I uh, just need to run this, you know, that Tishon Ayala is probably because of her connectivity to the rest of the graph, more interesting for the spreading of the disease inside this community, right? Just because she's been connecting too much, right? So she's been connecting to places and other people too much, and therefore there's a higher risk associated. And actually, if you look at some of these other algorithms here, there's some really interesting ones, uh, something called between the centrality, right? This is actually a very predictive, um, 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 scoring methodology. Why? Why? Because it tells you something about how things that are sticking together, right? So there's a community of of people here, and there's a community of people of people there. In the middle, there's a couple of people that are connected to both communities. Guess what? They have a very high betweenness, right? These are the people that might cause the pandemic to jump from this community 
to the other community. So we want to know who these people are. We want to know the people that are have a high between this centrality, for example. Right? There's also other algorithms here like uh, community detection. I'm not going to go into that. I just recommend that you go to sandbox.nefj.com, take it for a spin. And if you have any questions about it, I'll, I'd love to talk about it and, and see uh, and see if it would be relevant for you. Right? So there's quite a bit of uh, experiments that you can take here. Um, a lot of uh, tools that you can look at here. I also want to illustrate a little bit of the the visualization possibilities that you have here, right? So, oh, yeah, it's obviously it's disconnected. I will have to do that some other time. Uh, but there's some visualization possibilities that you can take into account here. Not just looking at the structure and the and the raw properties, but also coloring the the, the graph in certain ways, putting icons on it, making it more usable for business-oriented people. Um, that that's actually a real big part of what we do. Right, so I'll I'll wrap up uh, there. Um, I've I've covered quite a bit, and I know I'm conscious of our our timing constraints here. Um, so um, with that, I think uh, I'd like to hand it back over to you, uh, Bruce, to uh, to uh, guide us to the next part of this uh, this webinar. Thank you very much, Rick. Excellent presentation. We just had a, a question from Hans Lasser. Um, he was wondering if there were any tools for converting a graph into a relational database and vice versa. Oh yeah, yeah. There's 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 quite a bit of uh, tooling. I mean, uh, I I skimmed through this obviously, but uh, in what we say here in 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 uh, the 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 graph technology platform kind of is that D4J has uh, some capabilities that allow you to um, introspect uh, uh, a relational database read the data model from the system tables and then suggest a mapped uh, graph data model uh, that that's derived from the relational uh, system right that's one way of doing it but essentially there's like a number of data integration tools that that allow you to do this and to do it in bidirectionally right so you can you can pump data from a relational system into an EFJ system and the other way around um, there's some really easy to use tools for that. I would recommend that you take a look at the uh, Neo4j ETL tools. Um, another question that we have um, from Simon Tilly is how to represent the, the temporary of the edges. How to represent what, sorry? How to represent the temporality of the edges. Okay, that's a that's a great question. Um, well, I mean, obviously you can you can put timestamps on everything, right? So Neo4j, have, you know, back in the old days when I first started at Neo4j, we didn't have a temporal data type, so it was a lot more complicated uh, to do this. These days, you just have temporal data types, and you can just put uh, time and date properties, and you can you can you can calculate uh, very uh, you know like. Uh, how do you say that? Periods of time and, and those types of things. It's super easy to do these days. The question that the person is hinting at, I think, is you know how do I how do I run through um, different versions of my graph, you know, and see how it evolves, right? But that's a different question, <laughs> and it's a much more complicated question. Um, and we do have solutions for that, and there are tools for that. Um, but the bottom line is that it 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 really needs to be built into your data model, uh, right? So in your data model, you need to separate the the structure of your graph from the state of your graph, right? And if you do that, if you if you basically represent the structure like this, and 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 then say, okay, this structure has a number of instances, right? And they those instances follow each other, right? So they get versions. Right? That allows you to, to travel back and forth into time and to look at the structure at different points in time. Right? Uh, it needs to be built into the model. We have tools for that. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, it's not that complicated, but uh, please talk to us and we will help you out with that because you know, the first time you look at it, it might be a little bit daunting. Thank you, Rick. We have um, one more question. Um, which is um, from a colleague, uh, Martin Romacher, who's using RFD triple store domain. Um, he's looking to move to Neo4j and he's asking if you could elaborate on the migration and conversion pathway from RDF to Neo4j. Oh yeah, great, great question. Um, that I would, um, 
I would definitely, uh, um, um, the, the name escapes me right now, but there's a tool, there's a tool for this. Uh, it, what you will find if you start working with, with uh, Neo4j is that it's very much a Swiss, Swiss army knife with a lot of tools that can be bolted on top of it. Um, there's an extension, um, name escapes me right now, uh, to Neo4j. It's actually an open source project that allows you to point to uh, a triple store endpoint uh, like, for example, we've done it a bunch of times with Wikipedia or, or other, uh, you know, DBpedia, other other uh, uh, no, notable uh, uh, triple store endpoints. And then you can basically suck it uh, out of those uh, stores for, with a Spark on query and then convert that into Neo4j uh, data structures uh, if that would be, you know, a good, a good way of doing things. Note that, you know, while uh, triple stores are graph databases, right? So they, 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 they are not, some, they are a particular kind of graph databases uh, using a subset of the Neo4j data model, right? So the, the Neo4j data model is actually a richer data model, the, proper, the labeled property graph. And so when you go from one to the other, there's a high probability that you want to go through some modeling or remodeling uh, of your data model. So I would I would recommend that you take a look at the tools. Um, I will put it in the chat as soon as I remember after this talk uh, what the name of the tool is. Um, uh, but then also uh, please do make sure that you go through some 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 thorough assessment of the data model. So Rick, we have um, a comment from one of the uh, one of the individuals uh, on the on the presentation now. Wolfgang Jürgen have mentioned that the, the tool that they're using is Neo Semantics. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I uh, all that Belgian beer. Sorry. <laughs> so one one question we have here is: What are the advantages of Neo 4J tools over existing packeted packages such as uh, Networks in Python? Oh, I. Uh, I, you know, like I said during my presentation, you can represent uh, graphs in Excel files if you wanted to, uh, but what you can do with it greatly varies uh, depending on um, how do you, how do I say that? You know, the the applicability or the the nativeness of the tool. I would say that you know, if Network X, it will probably work really well uh, for smaller data sets, and you know, uh, kudos, right? Great, great, great choice. Uh, but I, I will bet you my right arm that uh, for larger data sets or for more performant, you know, query speeds, you will need something else. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's uh, Neo4j is just going to be a lot more scalable, a lot faster, probably more flexible. Um, but you know, for smaller data sets, it doesn't really matter, right? It's you can do that with whatever. For larger data sets or more intense applications, I think you will find that a native tool set is going to give you a, a lot of advantages. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Rick. That was fantastic. Um, in a matter of time, we should move across to uh, to Kirsten Langendorf, who's representing uh, S Cubed. And she's going to be speaking on the benefits of removing data silos uh, for the pharma industry. And also a bit of an example of uh, COVID dot codegraph.org. So passing across to, uh, to, to Kirsten. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Can you hear us, Kirsten? Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect, you're online. Okay, and you can see my slides. Slides are up and running. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, hello, I'm Kirsten Mangdorf, as uh, I mentioned, and uh, thank you for providing the opportunity to present here today. 
Um, I will be presenting, and unfortunately, my colleague Dave Iverson Hurst is not able to present today, so you have to, to live with me. I'm uh, not as experienced as Rick is. I'm a newcomer to the, uh, to the uh, graph technology, so bear with me. Um, with what I'm about to show, I'm new to this. But um, today I will uh, focus on uh, the stuff that I've done in, in connection with Copy Graph. Um, and uh, may, I mainly done that in my spare time, but uh, but I've uh, it's okay. It's of course in the within the brand of SQ because I work for SQ. Um, I will also show you a little bit of how we use Neo4j in in the way, what we do on our daily life before I switch into the work that I've done with the Neo4j or Neo4j with Kobe Graph. And uh, I think it, it might better become a little nerdy at towards the end because I'm, I'm going to show you some of my uh, cipher queries and uh, some of the challenges that I faced while doing the COVID-19 uh, graph stuff. Um, but um, let me just show you, start by talking about who we are as Uh Very briefly, we are a consultancy company. We are based in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and also in the UK. And uh, what we do is that we are providing uh, consultants to the pharmaceutical industry within statistical uh, the area and data management. And um, we also have a part of our business is doing data analytics using Click and doing uh, different BI reporting. We also have a, a part of the organization that deals with regulatory affairs. And then the part that I'm part of is the uh, bottom uh, right half, which is the what we call clinical standards management. And uh, we are building a tool based on graph technology, which we call A3 Suite. And it's a, uh, it's a graph-based platform or a tool that allows the pharmaceutical industry to uh, work with uh, standards. And uh, so we have a, what we call an MDR where people manage the different standards for clinical studies. And then we have another tool that we call Study Workbench, uh, which is um, a tool that will allow the users to set up the uh, studies. And we also provide uh, services uh, or helping people uh, in the pharmaceutical industry adopting uh, graph technology. And then we provide training in uh, CDISC, which is a data standard used within the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Our so-called study world is very much connected. As this is just a, I can say, a, a abstract world of or the picture of how a study actually looks. Um, we do when we start a study, you do a lot of planning. You write a protocol. You specify what you need to collect during a study. And actually, behind the scenes, there are a lot of things that are linked together, even though you don't really see it. Then there's a lot of things being uh, defined and set up how to collect the different information for the for the studies or the patients that we're going they're going to ask for information. They are setting up the uh, EDC system, electronic data capture systems, and all kinds of uh, other tools that collect data. Then the study runs and data is coming back, and you organize the data. You put them into this standard which is the CEDA standard. So there's a certain structure that the pharmaceutical companies need to uh, adhere to. So uh, these data needs then to be, to be created. And uh, from those data sets, you do analysis and eventually you end up with a result, whether a certain drug is better than the other one or how safe it is. And along the way, there's a lot of um, uh, things linked together. Uh, and then within this space, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, this end-to-end -end, uh, automation, end-to-end -end traceability, and uh, we believe with the tool that we are building uh, that uh, graph technology is a good way to ensure that you, you have an easy way of maintaining this uh, traceability. And the traceability is also something that the, um, the uh, authorities would like to see uh, in a certain document. Um, so they would like to see, okay, given an analysis, where did I, what page did I collect this piece of information and what happened to it uh, uh, from, from the result to how it was collected, so backwards comp uh, compatibility. So that's a lot of challenges in there and, and, and making sure that you have uh, all, 
all the information needed to, to make this traceability. A little bit about what we use uh, Neo4j for. We, as I said, we have this MDR and the study workbench, these two tools that we are building. The first one is, is not based on Neo4j, uh, but the other one is. Um, so uh, the study workbench is, is as I said, uh, setting up a study. We make what we call an annotated case report form, CRF, and we also uh, study. They also make a what they call a defined XML uh, document, which is a data definition document. A certain standard needs to be applied. And uh, when you set up that study, that's actually a lot of it. It's just metadata. And our tool is then uh, helping people working in a in a the way that they know and not need to deal with all the underlying um, technical details. Um, so that's our goal, that you don't need to know a lot about graphs or connectivity. You just do what you normally do, uh, working with studies, and then you get the connectivity behind the scenes. We have also, um, um, we have also, um, made an, um, a prototype, or my colleague Dave has made a prototype where we would like, where we see the data coming back into the graph. So we have both the metadata and the data um, uh, connected. And then you kind of have, you can say, a, a warehouse or a whole cloud of both the metadata and data together. And that's basically our goal with what we're building at the moment. So obviously uh, we're improvising here a little bit, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I, but I do want to make sure that you get the most out of this uh, session. And if Kirsten takes a little bit more time to get back, um, then uh, uh, maybe I can just still uh, give you a little bit of a pointer here. Um, because I know that uh, what S cubed and what Kirsten has been working on uh, in the past couple of months, uh, as an EFJ partner as well, uh, is very much related to this initiative. It's an initiative called COVID Graph. Um, it's a fascinating uh, uh, initiative, uh, and I, I can't explain it as well as, uh, as Kirsten could because she's much more involved, but uh, enough to get you, uh, get you updated here, I think, is what these people are doing and who these people are. It's, it's, a, it's really a consortium of a lot of different um, graph experts, I would say, right? And, uh, you know, there's people from s -cubed involved, there's people from Incurious involved, but you can see that there's a number of other um, uh, people involved here. It actually started with these two guys here, uh, Kaiser and Preusser, which is a small integrator in Germany, and the German Center for Diabetes Research, who is uh, a long time Neo4j user and customer uh, in Germany. Uh, who basically realized that you know what they were doing in diabetes research, right, which was essentially you know putting together all kinds of data and trying to make sense of it and and trying for that to advance um, uh, uh, diabetes research, they could apply the same techniques to COVID research. And I see that Kirsten is already back, <laughs> so I don't want to uh, uh, intrude uh, on her time either. But that's. Uh, while you're getting ready, Kirsten, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just point people to this website, covidgraph.org, right, where you can find uh, a number of these um, tools that they are building, right, tools that they are building, uh, which are very illus illustrative of how people could use graph technology to make sense of data, right? So. Um, uh, some really interesting applications for querying it. Uh, um, yeah, so so I was talking about COVID graph as an example of how lots of different pieces of data are being brought together, and you know it's really quite elaborate what they've done here. It's it's uh, you know lots of different medical databases, uh, research databases, test result databases. There, there's an amazing wealth of information that they've brought together here, um, and uh, you know you can see it here uh, uh, the the different um, uh, ideas that they've brought together here, right? And so this is really targeted, uh, not so much at, at uh, you know, my, me or anyone else, it's really targeted at, at medical researchers, right? Medical researchers that could, that could um, hopefully and potentially uh, learn from past research and leverage that past research to figure out a way to create a cure or a, or a vaccine or a, or a, or a, or a, you know, 
some kind of uh, instrument to treat the disease um, more quickly. One of the one of the first um, um, uh, results that they found was um, um, oh, yeah, you can tell that I'm not an, an expert here, uh, but they found that there was the, like this general uh, virus uh, um, treatment uh, drug that was actually proving to be similar to other uh, virus uh, treatment drugs and that they could actually suggest that as a as a as an early treatment um, uh, possibility obviously not what we want and what we need yet uh, but uh, apparently that was one of the first um, uh, possible uh, avenues at least for uh, accelerated research into this uh, new pandemic i really recommend that you take a look at it knowledge graphs or this is for me. This is an example of a, of a knowledge graph. Right? And a knowledge graph um, is applied in many, many different cases. Right? Um, uh, we've we've got examples of uh, NASA, for example, using knowledge graphs to um, enable and uh, unlock their um, their um, um, past experiences. Right? Uh, lessons learned database, they call it. Um, and apparently, this was actually one of the one of the uh, one of the key things that they found out when they were developing a new um, um, uh, launch platform for astronauts to go into space and to come back from space. They needed a new landing uh, platform, a new landing capsule. Uh, the, the prototype that they had built here on Earth was uh, tipping over all the time which was exact, exactly what happened in the 60s and 70s when the first moon uh, uh, missions were actually happening. And so by unlocking the lessons learned database in a graph, they were able to say, okay, we can you know, go back to that engineering design. Um, that doesn't change. And, and we can leverage that to save time um, in the development effort of the, of the new landing capsule. Uh, so knowledge graphs are very much uh, a generic thing that you can apply to lots of different things and hopefully also to the COVID-19 um, um, use case. Sorry Kirsten, about I just that. keep talking. I just keep yeah, talking. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> I got these weird messages and nobody was answering. So I don't know what wrong. Now I'm on my phone's uh, internet connection. So I don't know. We normally have uh, high-speed internet at home, but it just dropped off. Yeah, I don't know off. if I should continue from the COVID graph or, um, yeah, I'll see I, if I, I can get I, I gave a quick introduction to what the project is and what what uh, what they've been doing and what knowledge graphs are. Uh, okay, but, uh, thank I can, you. you know you you are much more knowledgeable about this, so I'm going to <laughs> leave it to you now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But well, very quickly, I'll browse through. Um, you know, so we started uh, in uh, in March. The Danish. Uh, Denmark was locked down and uh, also this COVID-19 and our health minister in Tokyo told us, you know, we need to make sure that we don't over, um, you know, swarm the hospitals with the cases and everything that we had seen in Italy. And then we started working at home, which is the next picture. And then I thought, um, you know, we got this letter from the authorities, or I got that if you are health care educated, then uh, please join the, um, the emergency team. And I thought, oh, I couldn't help. So I was a little nerd uh, from the Lego film. So I, I thought, I can't help. So how can we help uh, with the math and computer science background? Um, so I got this uh, email from uh, Neil for Day, and uh, they talked about this um, COVID graph, knowledge graph, and it, it caught my eye. And um, that was really interesting. So I looked up their homepage and uh, looked at what they were the purpose was, and that was to bring uh, information together from various sources so that researchers can gain more knowledge about this new disease uh, from patents, papers, and they also wanted the clinical trial. So this is, can you see, my contribution to, to the COVID growth. Um, so I joined the team, I signed up, and I said uh, to them, I have been working in the pharmaceutical for 20 years, I know a little bit about clinical studies, and I've uh, recently, you know, working with uh, Neo4j. And um, so they said, uh, yeah, please help us. And uh, so we started with the source data 
there's a there's a mandatory there's a requirement to publish all the studies uh, on a, this website in the US called clinicaltrials.gov, and they have this API, even though it's a beta, but uh, you can access this one, and uh, you can. Um, you can uh, make some sort of search criteria. I went into the documentation and looked for, for the different kinds of uh, syntax there. And then I started to look for the studies. And um, in this uh, version here, you can only pull down a thousand records, JSON records at a time. But I could see from uh, when I looked at the, there was this limit. And uh, so I looked up, uh, in over here, you can see there for these interventional studies, there are actually more studies, I mean, 2,000 studies. Um, so uh, how to go about that? So I use this, um, there's every every record has a rank. These, uh, so you can see here the minimum rank and the maximum rank. So I use that uh, to, to make a loop query. And um, so um, I did a loop looping through the uh, for the different uh, records uh, like this now it's going really quickly because you lost a lot of time um, and then i actually uh, called the uh, another query using this uh, lower range and upper range that i did in the first uh, to get all the different uh, records um, in there so i learned a little bit of Cypher doing that. Um, so I wanted to share um, my what I did here with the rest of the community. So I, I did this paper on COVID graph that some of you might have read. Then a little bit about the uh, the modeling. Uh, so you know now you have access to all of this information. This is just a picture of the description that you can access on the page as well, describing all of the different fields. And I had a little chat with uh, Alexander. Um, from the COVID graph about he's the one of the uh, one of the researchers uh, and he we went through this and then discussed with what kind of information that they wanted and basically ended up with wanting most of it um, so um, some of the fields are mandatory like indicated here with a red uh, asterisk so I tried to um, model this uh, this graph for this uh, trial as best as I could from the knowledge that I have. First, first I did a lot of uh, properties, but then uh, putting it into the ecosystem of the code graph, we realized that we had to have some more nodes so we could connect to different nodes. Um, and um, so, yeah, so how did we model? I had a, a comment from one of my, uh, my colleagues and said, oh, how did you actually do the model? And it was just using my experience. And I think as you also mentioned, Rick, it's, uh, it's very intuitive. And then you, you want to describe actually what's, how, it, how is it represented? And you can do that via the, uh, the relationships and naming the, re the relationships in a sensible way. So I think it's very intuitive. And, well, yeah, that's this is one model. There might be, uh, you know, room for improvements. Um, then I had a little uh, other challenge uh, like this. We had uh, this was the different locations and uh, cities and states and countries. I skipped the state in this case. Um, and as you can see here in the JSON, there's a lot of data redundancy. Um, obviously, there were these six records, and I need to join them together pairwise. So I did a little uh, loop down here in the bottom, illustrated here that I did a for each um, for each uh, record in here. I will then join the things together. Um, also, I had an, another issue that I encountered. Maybe you can help me, Rick. Here, I don't know. Uh, I found out that if I had missing values for some of the things here, then uh, for some reason, uh, this part didn't come through. So I did a lot, a huge query here. And uh, because this was missing, this didn't come through in my, in my graph here. Um, so, but if I split it in two, then I got the graph that I wanted. Um, so it might be some uh, querying that I don't know of. Um, so, uh, yeah. I was getting uh, uh, progressed, so uh, a little bit of learning. Uh, as I said, I'm new to this, to this uh, new for j so I took this education in uh, 19, and uh, I've used it uh, within our organization for making a traceability matrix in respect to validation. But with this task, I got an opportunity to learn a lot more about Cypher and Graph in, in general. 
Uh, certainly the model can be improved, uh, I think so, and it's uh, always uh, have a good chat with the uh, colleagues about how the model can be improved. Um, perhaps also next step could be to try to use some machine learning um, to because the data is not that uh, standardized in all the ter in all the fields that we get through uh, back from the JSON. So uh, pairing data and cleaning data using machine learning could be done. And uh, we need to be aware of this missing value that I saw. And, uh, and the next step will then be to add the uh, trial results, because right now there are a few studies that has results, uh, which can also be interesting to have as part of the code class. Uh, yeah, and uh, so I realized that I was able to help, even though I'm a techie nerd. So with that, uh, and very short presentation, speedy, speedy. Uh, back to you, Ray. I think it would be useful to have a couple of uh of uh, of questions i do see two more that are open in the in the in the in the uh, question box uh, or actually one more the other one i've already answered i think you know it's a very interesting you know what are the mo main indicators influencing query time in a graph in a relational database as you mentioned the, the poison is joins what is it with graphs oh well uh that's a, a, a that's probably my favorite question <laughs> in the whole world. So, um, um, so this is kind of counterintuitive, right? But in a graph database, the data set size is not that material, right? It's not that big of a deal to uh, give you any indication on, um, on on what the performance of a query would be like. And that's because what, when you're querying a, a, a graph system, you're always going to try to make it quite local. You're going to try and reduce the scope of the query to you know, a particular thing, molecule, person, place, whatever it is, and everything that surrounds it. Right, so so the, the 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 sweet spot query of a graph database is a very local query, right? Because you you wouldn't have to explore the entire graph and you wouldn't have to explore the entire data set. You could just work with the starting point and the things connected to it. So the poison in a graph uh, system uh, is a global query, right? It's it's when you have to look at everything. Right, and some algorithms require you to do that. Right, there's no there's no getting around it. You you kind of have to if you want to if you want to understand centrality, if you want to understand communities, you know, all of those types of things. You need to look at the entire data set, and then you have to come up with smart ways of doing that so that you know you don't run into you know memory problems or whatever. Right, so uh, we we we've done a lot of work on this. But I can tell you right now that you know if you write a query that sucks in too much data, right, and that looks at a too big of a portion of the graph, you will very quickly find that your machine is starting to uh, <laughs> uh, to run on all the fans and and uh, and, and screaming for help. Um, that's just because it's a combinatory explosion. You everything is you know it's a connected structure. So if you if you suck in too much data it goes it, it just comes bigger and bigger and bigger and uh, that's that's poisonous as you as you said yourself so Hans that I hope that answers your question Hans laser uh, I think that's uh, that's probably what you want to take a, a good look at trying to keep the queries local and if you don't if you can't keep it local then you have to come up with ways to chop it up or 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 do it in a smarter way uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, there's another question um, from Hans Laza. Do I need a degree in data analytics or what are the experiences needed to develop a graph? I would say um, it's always good to have a little bit of domain knowledge, but I don't think you need a degree. <laughs> um, I think the, the, especially when using a PDA, it's very intuitive. Um, you kind of, um, it's very oral in some sense. You you can, if you can explain your your domain or the problem that you're trying to solve, then it's fairly straightforward to, to make a model. Of course, you need a little bit of um, ability to, to abstract the things you're talking about, but otherwise I think it's it's fairly, fairly similar. And the good thing is that you can, uh, it's very easy to, to change the model without it you know, interrupting a lot of things. And that's also what we're doing in the development of our tool, 
we can add on stuff. Um, so we don't have to have the full model in place from the beginning. We can add to the model as we go along. I don't know if you have any comments on that, Rick. Your experience. No, I could I couldn't agree more. I, I think you know we we you know it it sometimes it feels a little bit difficult to work with a graph because you kind of have to unlearn things a little bit. You know, yeah. I know for yeah. I know for a fact that you know. I would never, ever, ever have gotten my uh, my university degree if I didn't know my RDBMS modeling. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. and it was just mandatory, and and I was drilled to do it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and and if you actually if you if you think about it, graph modeling is like you were saying, Kirsten. It's actually a lot more uh, natural and and intuitive. But mm -hmm. I kind of have to unlearn my. <laughs> <laughs> relation re relational yeah. database modeling skills a little bit um, and yeah. and that creates a little bit of a hump to get across you know it's um i find i find that you know it's actually easier to model in a mm. graph database but mm. it's different from what yeah. i was forced to do in university and i kind yeah. of have to un unlearn that a little bit in order to be a good uh, graph database modeler if that makes any sense yeah. um yeah. i i would but say also that some of the things yeah, the things that we're seeing in um, in the data standards that we're working with is that sometimes um, you you make because you have so much knowledge in the domain that you're working, you kind of make implicit um, relationships in your head but just because two columns are next to each other. But it's not always um, uh, obvious that that's the case, and you really haven't described the relationship. It's just um, it's just because it's uh, in people's heads in some ways because the, the the columns are next to each other. So with a graph, you have more, much more explicit relationships also that you can query, um, and that can be a little more difficult when when if you have in, in the tab area. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we can have a long philosophical debate about it. I, I actually really think that it's a, it's more intuitive uh, yeah. because that's how our brain works. You know, we think yeah. associatively. And uh, and you know that's just how we are wired, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and as a consequence, it's it's a more natural way for us to think about data. You know, if you explain a yeah. if you ask a business user to explain mm. their problem to you, before you yeah. know it, they start drawing uh, <laughs> new things yeah. with, with arrows between them. You know, that's what yeah. they do because that's how yeah. they think. Uh, yeah. and, and before you know it, they're drawing graphs for you. And, yeah. uh, and I think it's a it's it's really a, a more natural way of modeling, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it it enables a lot a lot of um, new things that way. Mm -hmm. so, by by the way, you know the original uh, uh, computer system databases they were all graph databases, <laughs> right? So I mean the 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 when we had mainframes and you know back in the old days. They were all network-oriented databases. That's how yeah. people started out. The problem yeah. was that you know you needed more resources, and those resources weren't available, yeah. right? And, and so, as a consequence, people 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 went backwards a little bit. But the original database systems were network database systems. You know, yeah. when I first told my dad that I was going to work for neo 4 j and I explained it to him, and he was like. Oh, I used to do the same thing in the seventies. You know that—that's literally what he told me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's—it's it's just the way it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a final question um, from Hans. He says, "Thank you very much." But what are the next steps in developing graphs? Um, what's your opinion on the future and what it's gonna, what's it going to look like? Next steps in the uh, features. I would love to see some. Uh, one of the things that I've been um, pondering about was um, some ways of because uh, the graph can be really, really big, as we saw also on, on Rick's slides, and um, it could be really great if you can make some nice visualizations of the graph. Um, I have a. I think I have a. I have a book. I can't recall the author, but it's something about uh, graph is beautiful or something. Infographics is beautiful. It's about having uh, another a very visual way of of um, uh, displaying all the data in a, in a in a smart way. Um, that could be really 
fantastic if you could um, you can make some sort of visualization to, on on top of grass. That was be my wish. We've made a lot of progress on that, actually. Uh, you know, if you look at the older visualization technologies, they were all based on, you know, older browser technologies. Now we have, yeah. uh, we actually have, uh, you know, graphic processors in most laptops and tablets and phones these days, mm -hmm. and and the modern browsers are able to exploit those. I mean, yeah. Uh, so so it becomes possible to have mm -hmm. bigger graphs. Uh, uh, represented on a on a on a on a in a visual way. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, as soon as you're looking at stuff that is like a little bit, you know, like a couple of million things, it just mm -hmm. becomes a big higher ball. You know, it's it's like it's not it's not possible. You know, you no. again again you kind of have to you have to you have to make it more local. You have to uh, uh, look at a part of the graph to make any sense out yeah. of it. But if you can aggregate it in some sense, I don't know if it's possible with AI and whatnot, um, then that it could be really cool having some some tools on top of that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, 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 we're starting to look at these things, right? So in, in the last uh, version of um, the graph data science library, um, you've got these um, graph patterns that you can uh, um, yeah. that, that you can pull out and represent as a subset of the graph and, yeah. and then and then start reasoning over subsets uh, which yeah. is you know kind of like an aggregate for uh, for uh, for a graph structure um, so yeah. there's there's a lot of stuff that's starting to happen there but you know yeah, there's a little bit more more work that that, that needs to be done so Me, from, my, from my from my perspective I, I'd love to see more um, uh, intuitive ways of 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 um, of reasoning over graphs, you know, of, yeah. of inferring yeah. new knowledge, you know, defining finding new patterns, um, yeah. you know, the whole suggesting. Layer on top of it. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, interesting work that needs to needs to happen there. Um, I think inferencing, which is kind of natural to to the people in the in the triple store world, yeah. um, and yeah, when we start applying that to to property graphs, it's actually super interesting as well. Yeah, some of the things if you log on, if you go to the covidgraph.org and try to uh, you know see the graph, and then you can browse the graph and look for different things as a visualization on top of it. And uh, they have used different icons for different, for instance, the clinical trials have a certain icon. And, and that's also what we're trying to, to use in our in our tool. So for instance, the biomedical concepts that I talked about earlier, if you heard that, <laughs> it has an icon and uh, something. So so it's um, it, it can be easier to um, you know separate one node from another one visually. That's just a small, tiny step in, in getting a better of view of what, what you have. Cool. I think uh, mm -hmm. we're already over our time, so I'm, yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if uh, if we, we should get that the people can... network. That was horrible. <laughs> I don't know what I happened. We managed quite well. Yeah. Okay. I hope you heard some of it. <laughs> Gil, thank you very much um, for your time with the presentations today, Rick and Kirsten. It's been great having you with us. Um, thank we'll keep you. Keep back with our audience. And um, yes, uh, thank you very much for being with us today and being part of the BioData series. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye.